Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, event here. My name is Alex Cooley. I am the current director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University and a professor of political science at Barnard College. And it is just a great pleasure and a privilege on behalf of Harriman and of New York uh, University's Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia to welcome you to today's uh, event debate, uh, the new U.S.-Russian Cold War, who is to blame? So this is part of a Columbia NYU New York Russia public policy series that my colleague Josh Tucker and I have been running over the last two years. And the purpose is to spotlight issues uh, involving Russia to bring together a New York-based community that's interested in academic research, uh, but also uh, is professionally involved in the region and to really foster a network um, that uh, is interested in having these cross-professional types of dialogues. And so after a number of sessions, I think we saved the best for last uh, <laughs> today, and we're just uh, delighted to announce that we'll keep this going next year. Um, the series is funded by a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, so thank you, Carnegie, for your generous support. Our two Speakers today, uh, Stephen Cohen, uh, who grew up in Kentucky and received his BS and MA degrees from Indiana University and a PhD from Columbia, is Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU in Princeton, and author of several well-known books, including Bukhara and the Bolshevik Revolution, a political biography, Rethinking the Soviet Experience, Failed Crusade, America and the Tragedy of Post-Communist Russia, um, and then he's working on a new book, Why Cold War Again, which will be published in 2009. A longtime media commentator, Professor Cohen writes regularly for The Nation magazine, and he is a recipient of several awards and also a member of the board of the American Committee for East-West Accord. And then Ambassador and Professor Michael McFall is a professor of political science, director and senior fellow at the Freeman uh, Spogli Institute for International Studies, and the Peter and the Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He joined the Stanford faculty in 1995. He is also an analyst for NBC News. You may have seen him over the last few days. Uh, uh, and a contributing columnist to the Washington Post. Dr. McFaul uh, served for five years in the Obama administration, first as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council at the White House from 2009 to 2012, and then as the US ambassador to the Russian Federation 2012-2014. He is the author of many books, um, but his new From Cold War to Hot Peace, An American Ambassador in Putin's Russia, uh, has just been published and is available for purchase uh, downstairs. And Ambassador McFall will uh, sign copies for you, I'm sure, after the event um, if you stick around. Uh, so that's all for me. Uh, I want to welcome you again. I know this is a really busy time of year, but the topic is hot and it's really important and what to do about Russia, how our Russia policy has possibly strayed, and you know, what we should do going forward are all vitally important issues for the academic and the policy community. Now, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Josh Tucker, who will moderate uh, the session. He is a professor of politics at NYU, director of the Jordan Center there, and he will lay out the ground rules uh, and keep us all in line. Josh. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. I want to join Alex as well in thanking our distinguished, distinguished speakers today. I know we're all really looking forward uh, to the discussion and as well to thank all of you for coming out at this time of year uh, for the audience today. I also want to welcome people who are live streaming the event right now and in particular welcome the people at the Jordan Center. We're, we're live streaming it back at the Jordan Center at NYU for those who couldn't make it north of 14th Street. So um, <laughs> I. I'm going to go over the format really quickly of what's going to happen here, um, and in particular, there's a part, there's a, a big part for you to pay attention to as well. So the way it's going to work is we're going to invite each of the speakers in turn to come up and give about 15 minutes of remarks uh, on the subject, on the topic, and that's what we're going to start off. So they're each going to get about 15 minutes of remarks. At that point, 
We'll have a brief pause for technical issues, and we're going to raise this screen up, and we'll bring out a little table here. So that doesn't mean the event's over. It's not even an intermission. It's just, but if you need to stretch, it's a good time to stretch. So we'll bring the table out, and we'll get started up. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have uh, some time for the candidates. Uh, the candidates. <laughs> we're going to have some time. <laughs> we're going to have some time for the speakers. Uh, to respond respectfully to the points the other person has made. And, uh, and Alex and I may ask a few questions to sort of prompt that discussion. And then the second half of the session will turn over to you, the audience, both here physically in the room and virtually. Uh, the way we're going to do this is when you came in the room today, you should have been given an index card. We will have, during the point where the screen's being raised and the table's coming out, we'll have our ushers circulate through the room. You, at that point, can, write a qu can hand over your index card. You can write a question down whenever you'd like. If you want to write a question down later on in the session, after they've spoken, you know, after the follow-up, when they're talking back to each other, that's fine, too. Raise your hand with the card, and we'll, do as we, we'll try to grab the cards at that point. So that's the way we're going to do questions. People are going to write cards. For those of you who are watching on live stream, you can tweet questions using the hashtag Cohen McFall, and we'll monitor the Twitter feed on that hashtag. So it's Cohen McFall, one word, hashtag Cohen McFall. We'll look for questions on Twitter. Um, and for those of you who are back at the Jordan Center, you can give your questions to Heather, who will put them on a Google Doc, and we'll be monitoring that as well. So we're going to try and get questions from a variety of different formats, involve people who are here and people who are watching uh, from other places. And then the questions will, be flow, will flow through uh, Alex and I. The final thing I just want to let everybody know is that this is an on-the-record event. It is being recorded. It's being live streamed, as you might have picked up already. Um, and it's going to be archived. So please remember everything you say here is on the record. And this is, you know, this is an academic event. And as an academic, as academic institutions, we welcome the clash of ideas. We welcome different perspectives, but we also welcome them in a respectful manner. Uh, and we and we hope that everyone will enjoy the spirit of that today. That we will be having different viewpoints, but we will be treating those viewpoints uh, with respect, and we'll look for questions and comments in that regard as well. Oh yeah, and questions should be questions on the card, as in having a question mark at the end of them. Okay, without further ado, we're going to begin, and I want to welcome first uh, Professor Stephen Cohen, who's going to come up and give our first 15-minute uh, opening remarks. I was down in New Orleans not long ago, and I saw a gun shop, Cohen and McCain. <laughs> what do you think? What to say? I think I want to say that today just completed May 9th in Russia, Din Pabedi, Victory Day, the most sacred secular holiday in Russia. When I was a kid growing up in Kentucky, we had a very sacred holiday called VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. It, because of the clock, it was on May 8th. So far as I know, it no longer exists in America as a day when schools are closed. Therein lies part of what we might not express today, but part of the differences that have evolved over the years uh, between Russia and the United States. I think this is a very important event. Not because I'm here, I'm just a stand-in. Partly because the very distinguished multi-credentialed Ambassador Professor Michael McFall is here, I'm grateful. I once knew him as Mike before, uh, but I'm so glad he's here. But it's important essentially for this reason, that we are now in a new Cold War with Russia, and it is more dangerous than the preceding Cold War. I know that could be a separate subject of debate, and it might come up tonight, but that's what I feel. My point is, is that this new and more dangerous Cold War has evolved over more than 15, 16, almost 20 years without any real sustained substantive public debate in America. Not in the media, not in the universities, not in Congress, almost never in elections, not on the campuses so far as I can see. This is entirely different from the 1970s and 80s, when I entered public life, 
When this country was then debating Cold War and detente, and the country was full, high in DC, low with the anti-nuke movement at the grassroots of debate. Uh, without debate, if we behave democratically, there is no way to review long-standing long foreign policy and to hope that we might change it democratically. But we have had in place more or less the same policy toward post-Soviet Russia for 20 to 25 years. I think a fundamentally false policy, but it has remained intact partly because uh, it's not been publicly debated. So to me, that's the importance of this. I don't think if this event is any kind of precedent and encourages other debates, there'll be any winner or loser here t today. Uh, if Professor McFaul and I can inspire others to do what we're doing, I think everybody wins. When the debates unfolded in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, Grudgingly, but eventually, the opposing sides in this country came to agree, as did scholars later, that both sides, Moscow and Washington, were responsible in their own ways for what became the 40-year Cold War, and that therefore, they had to seek mutual ways of containing it preventing it from becoming nuclear war, and if possible, ending it. It's different in the United States today. Almost unanimously, there are a few exceptions, but they're not heard loudly or consistently. It said that Russia, and specifically Putin's Russia, as it's called, and more specifically, Russian President Putin is to blame. I prefer the word responsible for uh, the new Cold War. And that's one reason why the new Cold War is more dangerous than the preceding one. The absence of, a day, uh, of debate leaves us with an explanation which suggests that America need not review its policy or change it. So as I say, um, if this becomes the start of more debates, all of us have to be very grateful to Professor Cooley and um, to Josh Tucker for, for, for sponsoring this debate, and certainly to Professor McFall for making time for it. I certainly I am grateful. How do you do it, though? How do you debate such a large, fraught, complicated subject? Responsibility for the new Cold War. So I'm going to start with the axiom that I've always liked, formulated by the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, whom I paraphrase only for the sake of gender correctness. Moynihan, Moynihan said, everyone is entitled to his or her own opinions, but not to his or her own facts. I would add only that if any of us, scholars, journalists, pundits, medical doctors, auto mechanics, proceed without verified facts, we will certainly malpractice. And we've seen that in recent American political history. But the question is, where do we find the facts that we need? I think consensual facts, even if crudely or elliptically stated, for our own opinions or interpretations or analysis. And for me, the only place is history. Because to a certain extent, history has been vetted. We have memoirs, we have analyses, we have a scholarship, we even have documents, we even have archives. Therefore, what I'm going to do very quickly in my 15 minutes is to remind you, because I look out on the room, I see that final examinations have snatched our youngest generation. Uh, I remind most of you, not all of you, um, should I say that my daughter, my youngest daughter, only a few hours ago finished law school right next door? I should say that. She took her last exam. I'll remind you of the highlights of this history of American foreign policy toward post-Soviet Russia. Uh, 
Bearing in mind that along the way, I think, we lost a historic opportunity for an authentic Russian-American, American-Russian strategic partnership. I don't believe in friendships between nations or friendships between leaders. I believe in partners. Uh, going around and saying Boris or Vladimir or whomever is my friend is uninteresting. Is he your partner? Do you have business to do about our mutual interests and our mutual security, whether you like him or not? So, here's how you begin this, because I think as a historian. When did the Cold War end, if it ended? Sometimes I'm not sure it did, but let's say it ended. It ended according to the three main participants, Soviet President Gorbachev and American President Reagan and Bush, in 1989 maybe 1991. It ended because they said it ended and because the Soviet Union bloc in Eastern Europe vanished and the wall came down. And they went on to say it ended through negotiation among equal partners. It was a negotiated end of war, a negotiated end of war. And they went on to say there were no winners or losers. In that spirit, in 1990, Gorbachev made an enormous concession. He agreed to a reunited Germany, because that was unfinished business of the First Cold War. Germany was the epicenter of the First Cold War, political. He agreed to a reunited Germany in NATO. And it was a hard thing for him to sell at home. In return, he got promises, and you've all heard this expression, it's become a cliche, that NATO would never move two inches to the east. That promise made has been challenged over the years, but it is now indisputably documented because the declassified documents have been published by the National Security Archive in December last year in Washington. It's all there. And it wasn't only Bush and the Americans, it was the French, the Germans, and the British who made this promise to Gorbachev in memos and verbally. This was the origins, the fateful turning point, in two respects. NATO today, of course, sits on Russia's borders, very far to the east, in the Baltic region. And it is headed, no matter what they tell us, still toward Georgia and Ukraine. It's stalled, but it's only stalled. That began what Putin, but not only Putin, even the president that I think Professor McFall knows quite well, Dmitry Medvedev, have said over the years repeatedly a series of American broken promises and deceptions. Meanwhile, after this agreement, Washington made things worse. The very first President George Bush, who had agreed to this negotiated end of the Cold War, then reinterpreted it during his presidential re-election campaign against Bill Clinton and said, no, we won the Cold War. This is an entirely different interpretation. Russia now becomes not an equal partner in the peace, but a defeated power analogous maybe to Germany and Japan after World War II, and maybe to be treated accordingly. Thus arose, I think, however you have formulated it, the triumphalist axiom in American foreign policy toward Russia, post-Soviet Russia, that flourished under Clinton and continues even, certainly, I don't know what Trump does, but continued through the Obama administration. The history of the Clinton administration's policy towards Russia is well documented. I wrote a book about it, Failed Crusade, Several other people did. Its reputation today is not very good. I call Clinton's approach to Russia a winner-take-all approach, uh, a kind of triumphalist attitude toward Russia, done with a physically alien, uh, ailing and psychologically needy Russian President Boris Yeltsin. In Russia's internal affairs, 
people with the blessing of the Clinton administration meddled, to use a fashionable word today, in ways far exceeding Russiagate allegations today. Americans sat in official Russia offices in Moscow and the provinces, drafted legislations and laws, favored certain political candidates, got loans for the government on political terms, helped rig Yeltsin's reelection in 1996. Both Michael and I were in Moscow that year. You could see it, it was not a secret. Abetted the oligarchs plundering of Russia's wealth by helping them launder the money, including at the Bank of New York, but many other places. And while the majority of Russians, the figure would seem to be around 75%, were in misery, poverty, despair, the Americans and the American government said it was a transition to democratic capitalism and a very good thing for them. In foreign policy, Washington browbeat and bribed Yeltsin in various ways regarding NATO expansion and the bombing of Serbia in 1999, but I'll give you one illustration from his top Russia advisor's memoir, Strobe Talbot. When Clinton turns to Talbot and worries how much longer, and I quote, he can turn to Yeltsin and say, okay, here's what you gotta do next. Here's some more shit for your face. This is Clinton speaking, not me. This was the reality that lurked behind the professed strategic friendship and partnership of the Clinton years. And it all ended, as you know, in 1999. Yeltsin forced to retire. Russia in your ruins and resentful. A once substantially, I think Michael would agree, pro-American country, now not so much so, resentful toward America. And I tell you for sure, the backlash that was coming, anyone could have seen it, could have been a lot worse than Vladimir Putin. A lot worse. What happens next under the Bush administration illustrates, though, how powerful this impulse, this triumphalist winner-take-all impulse, remained, even though it had led to catastrophe in the 1990s. No lessons were learned. Here's the classic example. In the aftermath of the attack on America, September 2001, Putin, a new president, not all that strong, and against much opposition in Russia, gave more material assistance to the American war effort against the Taliban in Afghanistan than any other country in the world, including NATO countries. We could go through what he gave. He saved American lives. I don't know how many, but he saved American lives. He was in search of the real strategic partnership that Yeltsin never got. What did Putin get in return? He got more democracy promotion in Russia, a banner that had flown high in the 1990s, and all sorts of colored revolutions, semi-sponsored by the United States in Russia's neighborhood. But more importantly, he got another round of NATO expansion from Bush, this time headed right to the Baltics, to Russia's borders. And this was crucial. Bush unilaterally withdrew from the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Now that was, in addition to being an excellent thing for all of us, the bedrock of Russia's nuclear security policy. And we walked away. We had the right, legally, but we walked away. A new nuclear arms race, you know this, is underway today as part of the new Cold War. If you ask when that nuclear arms race began, Putin spoke about this in an interesting way the other day, it began when Bush left the ABM Treaty in 2002. Putin began to protest in his own way. He's kind of laid back, but he made it clear he was unhappy. Uh, and finally, he blurted it all out. You remember this famous moment in Munich in 2007 with Senator McCain and the others on the front row where he said, we are sovereign, uh, we want to be your partners, but we don't want to be your, what did he use? The word, uh, vassals. Uh, and things went south from there. Putin now being demonized even more. Uh, meanwhile, in fact, under Bush, the march 
in one way or another on Georgia and Ukraine continued. So we got the 2008 <clears throat> Russian-Ukrainian war. A European investigative commission found that Georgian President Saakashvili had started the war. This is beyond dispute, simply beyond dispute. What we don't know, or maybe Professor McFall knows, I don't know, the extent to which Washington did or did not encourage Saakashvili to attack. That to me is a question, a legitimate one, but I don't know the answer. So we come, uh, proxy wars, Cold War, horrible charges on both sides being leveled by the time President Obama becomes president. Um, I thought he was the man to break with the triumphalist, winner-take-all tradition. Uh, it proved not to be the case. I'm not sure why. Whether this rightfulness of American policy was too deeply ingrained in his head, the foreign policy bureaucracies, I don't know. Certainly it was in Congress and the media. And with all apologies to Professor McFall, and I don't know if he'd completely disagree, the new Cold War intensified and spread during the two Obama administrations. Um, though, looking back, and now we're talking about re -his recent history, we're saying only Putin was to blame. But think about some of the things Obama did and didn't do. When things didn't go his way with Russia, uh, he, or he permitted his aides, never Professor McFall, so far as I know, uh, to speak derisively, publicly, about Russia and Putin. We can enumerate the examples, culminating in his statement that Russia ranked with Ebola and ISIS as one of the three greatest threats to the world. I mean, an absolutely astonishing statement. Obama meddled in the highest Russian politics. Professor McFaul will correct me if I'm wrong, but during the reset, 2009-2011, uh, Vice President Biden in Moscow told a group of students, Putin should not, Putin was then Prime Minister, should not return to the presidency. And I've been told by an aide to Putin that he said that directly to Putin's face. That's pretty high level meddling in the presidential politics of another country. I regret to say, because I voted for him twice, that Obama was deeply complicit in the crisis in Ukraine in 2014. The European Union never should have forced on Kiev a choice as a trading partner between the European Union and Russia. That was an impossible choice, and Obama should never have permitted it. But he stood behind it, even though Putin turned to him and said, why? Why can't we have a tripart, three-way agreement? He found no relief in Obama's White House that I know of, though I don't know what Professor McFall was advising. And then, of course, in the events of Madan, Whatever we think about Ukraine since 2014, what happened there is clear. A coup, an unusual coup. It originated in the streets, but it spread. Overthrew the constitutionally elected president, Yanukovych of Ukraine. And much followed from that. Obama very quickly endorsed the new government. Very quickly. And in December 2016, weirdly, I think, he sanctioned Russia for Watergate allegations that still haven't been proved even today. So we come to this. Professor McFall feels that the reset, of which he was a prime shaper and participant, I understand, shows that my argument is wrong. That by now, Obama had abandoned this winner-take-all approach to Russia and set us on a new course. And it was only because Putin returned to the presidency in 2012 that that achievement was wrecked, spoiled, ruined. 
I read The Reset, and I, you should read McFall's book. It is a, a re, new book. It's a really good book, very interesting. Memoir, history, politics, analysis. It's very interesting. Uh, I reread, I went back to the section on The Reset. Uh, what I find there is what I found in The Reset originally. Uh, Russia got the START Treaty and membership in the WTO. Those weren't American concessions, and nobody had considered nuclear security agreements concessions. They'd been going on for 50 years, and nobody said it was a concession to make us safer. As for WTO, half of the Russian political class didn't want it, thought it was a bad idea. And whether it's been a good thing for Russia or not is still debated in Russia. And it may not last these sanctions now. But it wasn't a give. And there was some stuff about American private investment, but that was profit-oriented. And a relaxed visa regime, which is nice for those of us who want to go back and forth and don't have a diplomatic passport. What did Russia get? Give. Excuse me, what did Russia give? It gave what Obama and I presume Professor McFall wanted. It gave sanctions on Iran. A crucial Russian neighbor. Crucial, absolutely crucial. And it gave an expanded route for supplying American and NATO forces in Afghanistan. So we got what we wanted. Russia really got nothing. This was called selective cooperation. And best I understand this expression, Professor McFall has used it, so has Mrs. Clinton and others. Selective cooperation means we get they give, and we pretend it's diplomatic cooperation. And you know how the reset ended, uh, with another broken promise. Medvedev, then president, was told that if he didn't veto American attack on Libya, uh, and it went ahead, uh, that veto it at the UN, at the Security Council, uh, the United States and his allies would not attempt regime change, would not attempt to remove Gaddafi, and in fact, of course, they killed him. And Putin remains, not only Putin, extremely bitter. Yet another broken promise from Germany to Libya. So let me end. What's my opinion now? Because I think those are, are, are not just my facts, but substantially historical facts. So let me end with this. This is now my opinion. This is where Moynihan authorizes me. In my mind, and I am a patriot of American national security, and that's why I'm worried. In my mind, reading this as a historian, the record shows an aggressive America, not aggressive Russia. It shows, if we come to Putin, though all this began before Putin, a reactive foreign policy leader in Putin, always reacting. And in fact, this is often said critically about Putin in Moscow, that he never initiates, he reacts. Most recently, Everybody saw Crimea coming. He wasn't prepared. He wait, why did he wait so long in Syria? Why did he wait on Obama almost a year? He was always reacting. Not this aggressor Putin that's become the explanation of why we are innocent of responsibility for the new Cold War. Secondly, whatever the case, American policy has been riddled with double standards. I wrote down a list this long. I'm only going to give you one. We have said, in effect, that Russia has no legitimate national, not, uh, has no legitimate national interest on its own borders. And that what really it wants is a reactionary sphere of influence. Vice President Biden loved to accuse Moscow of this. But I ask you, what is the expansion of NATO from Germany to Russia's borders other than the largest in history ever peacetime expansion of a sphere of influence, American sphere of influence? They get none, we get it all. And when they complain, they're condemned for wanting a little sphere of influence, a zone of security on their own borders. This was utter folly. 
However you interpret this, 25 years, and I'll wrap up very, very soon, of US policy has not only generated a new Cold War, it's made us unsafe. Russia is, in my judgment, America's essential security partner, no matter who sits in the Kremlin. But Washington-led policy is driving, and here I don't know how to formulate, Professor McFall might, driving Russia from the West. This is a process. Happened under Stalin, it may be happening again. And then they say, and this is now a mantra, and policy analysis. And I fear, either begun or endorsed by Professor Obama, that we should seek to isolate Russia in world affairs. This is utter folly. It's impossible. Russia's too big, too important, too laden with everything. The non-West awaits Russia. The non-West, China, Iran, the BRICS nation, all these non-Western countries that taken together, I can't quite do the numbers in my head, that represent 35 to 45% of the world's landmass, people, labor force, GDP, and future markets. Who is isolating whom here? Underlying all this, and with this I will end, is what I call, and I've always called, the parity principle. Russia deserves is entitled to, by history, by security policy, acknowledgement that it is an equal power with the United States, with the same national interests <clears throat> and rights. We actually acknowledged that grudgingly during the Cold War. When you go back and read the protocols of the summits, it was announced. For some reason, and you see it in the demonization of Putin, we don't even recognize Russia as a legitimate power any longer. And that, I think, is the tragedy about which Professor McFall writes in his book. I, too, think it's a tragedy. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, there's a lot of history, a lot of facts that I'm going to go over quickly because I don't have time to do it. But I, what I want you to do is buy the book and read it, OK? Uh, Mother's Day is coming up. Actually, Father's Day is coming up. Graduation is coming up. There's a lot of facts in there that I'm not going to go into in detail. I want to give a, a kind of big argument so that we can get to the debate, OK? Um, so, and I'm going to think more like a political scientist and bounce around somewhere between a political scientist. I'm not a historian, although lots of political scientists accuse me of being one, by the way. And that's a pejorative term in political science. <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but I'm also a participant, right? And, and this is a little bit awkward for me because uh, on the one hand, I'm trying to analyze what's happened. On the other hand, I was in some of those events that Professor Cohen just described. And just to clear up a couple of facts that are, not, are incorrect, he did not say Putin should not run for president in front of students. That was at a meeting at Spasso House that was supposed to be off the record with five individuals. I was there. And he did not say to Putin, uh, you shouldn't run for president. I was at that meeting as well. So read about those facts in my book. But I want to do a big picture take, and then hopefully we'll get into some of the nitty gritty where some things actually I agree with Professor Cohen. And then I want to make sure at least by the end, we've isolated where we actually do disagree. So on the first thing, uh, the dependent variable, for those of you who study political science, we agree on the outcome. Whether it's the Cold War, this is what Medvedev said, whether it's worse than the Cold War, this is what our president said recently, of course, on Twitter. That's not interesting to me. I call it the hot piece deliberately to echo some of the elements that are similar from the Cold War, but also to suggest that there are elements that are different. And I don't, we may be in questions, we can talk about this graph in detail, but there are some things that are the same, there are some things that are different. We're not in a quantitative arms race, for instance, but we are in a qualitative arms race. Uh, we are not fighting between communism and capitalism or communism and democracy. That's over, thank goodness, from my point of view. But there is an ideological struggle under, underway. At least Vladimir Putin most certainly thinks it. Sometimes we engage, sometimes we don't. But we would both agree, at least I want to be clear about this, that the outcome today is scary. In some ways, it's scarier than the end of the Cold War. If I, for instance, was writing uh, the Ten Commandments for how to behave as a responsible great power, 
I would put at the top of my list, thou shall not use nuclear weapons, right? I'd put that at the top of my list. I'd put it second, thou shall not annex territory of my neighbor. That would be right at the top of my list. We didn't have annexation during the end of the, uh, in the Cold War for the last two or three decades. We do have that. Also, we didn't have sanctions, by the way. Never in the history of US-Russian relations was the chief of staff of the Kremlin on the sanctions list. That didn't happen during the Cold War. That's a new confrontational phenomenon that I was a part of. Uh, and by the way, it's resulted in personal tragedy for me, too. I'm on the sanctions list. As part of the quid pro quo, I can't go to Russia. This is the longest I've been out of Russia since 1983, the last four years, because of that quid pro quo. So it's similar and it's different, but that's not what I want to focus on in terms of the outcome. I think we both agree, uh, most certainly my book is about that this is a tragedy. Um, uh, and where we disagree, though, probably, is kto vinovat. By the way, it's praznikom, for those of you I see, I see some of the flags, Dian uh, Pabieri, but also kto vinovat, who is to blame. And I've been asked in this, this somewhat uh, uh, debate format that I'm not used to. The last time I did a debate, I was in high school in Montana. Uh, by the way, our case, because it's in the book, it's where the book starts, it was my junior year in high school. Uh, I just moved to a town called Bozeman, and the, politic, the topic was how to improve U.S. trade policy. Our case that my partner and I ran was repeal the Jackson Van Vanek Amendment to the 1974 Trade Act. Um, my partner, by the way, back then is now Senator Daines, Stephen Daines from uh, Montana. We were a pretty good debate team, by the way. Uh, later, I was part of the team. It took 30 years later, but we finally did repeal Jackson Vanek when I was in the government. But I've been asked to take, take the opposite side. Uh, I don't quite feel comfortable on that, and maybe I'll be allowed to be a little more free, uh, to not be in this uh, uh, black and white way, but I'm going to play the role that I was asked to for at least for the next 10 minutes. Um, and my theory, my argument, is that Russians ended the Cold War and Russians started the hot piece. And I'm saying that first one provocatively because I think Russians sometimes get left out of the story. Yes, the story was Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Heroes, in my view, in what they did to end the Cold War. No doubt about it. Uh, there were also other Russians and Ukrainians and Estonians and Latvians and Georgians who also mobilized to end the Cold War. These are people, this is March 1991. There I am, if you can see me, I, I'm there. Uh, Steve, were you there? Yeah, yeah, we were there. Um, and I, I, I tell you that story because too often this is always a story of elites getting together, concessions between elites. I want to remind you that people are also in, involved and they're involved sometimes in a way that pushes history in what I think is a positive way, because I think the end of the Cold War was a celebratory moment. And then in other times, they get in the way of people sitting behind uh, doors trying to close deals. And that's what I'm going to get to when I get to the Obama administration. Um, so this happened. It was, you know, it moved in this direction. Uh, I think we tend to overplay American agency. You want to talk about triumphalism, uh, it's, you know, it's to, to claim that somehow we we were part of ending the Cold War and, and bringing down the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and we write out all these people from history as if they didn't do anything. I think that's a huge historical mistake. But I want to remind you back then, because it's easy to forget. There's enough gray hair in this room. You, are, you don't forget. But when I talk at Stanford, I have to remind students that there wasn't continuity between 1989 and uh, 2018, in my view an in interpretation of U.S.-Russian relations. There was a time when we were on the same side on issues of democracy, on issues of markets, on issues of Western integration of Russia. Um, and Professor Cohen mentioned some of those Americans that work, were working in the, the, the offices during the government. He's absolutely right. I was one of them, by the way. I wasn't working in the government, but I worked for an NGO at the time. I want to remind you, we weren't meddling. We were invited. We were there because the Russian government, the democratically elected president of the Russian government, Boris Yeltsin, invited him there. Whether that was good or bad, we can judge. But let's be clear, they were, we were not there somehow doing regime change. We were there doing regime consolidation at the invitation of these people. Um, and so remember, the 90s were up and down. And I'm going to skip through this because I want to get to the punchline about what happened. Um, 
and to try to just tell you what happened, the, the, the story, and I, and I think I'll just focus on the Obama era because that's the part I know best and that to me is the most consequential because that's the most consequential part of my book. Um, it is true, all of these things happen, the things that Professor Cohen just talked about. These are facts, I agree with Professor Cohen. Uh, when I go back and I look at it, I actually think the great sin was not who, what was promised to Gorbachev in 1990 about NATO expansion. By the way, I do, I've done some negotiating with the Russians. It's really strange to me that you just agree to agree. Usually you write things down and you codify it in treaties. But that, that's a minor issue. I think the greatest sin was that we didn't engage with those that wanted to be part of the West, that, the, that wanted to have a democratic society, that wanted to have uh, uh, real markets and the rule of law. We drifted away. Remember, it was the economy stupid back in 1992. Nobody was paying attention to what was happening then. And if we have time and questions, I think it's worth thinking about that counterfactual. Um, uh, but these other ones happened. NATO expanded, Serbia was bombed, Iraq was invaded. No, let me, let me rephrase that. We bombed Serbia, we bombed Iraq, uh, we expanded NATO. All those things happened. And the color revolutions, uh, Serbia 2000, Georgia 2003, Ukraine 2004, uh, we didn't do those things. I think it, our role, like usual, Americans exaggerating their role in what other small-D Democrats are doing. All of these events most certainly, however, intensified conflict and tension in U.S.-Russian relations. That is true. That all happened. And yet, after all of those things, there was this period called the reset. I was part of the government. And it was a, a, a strategy to try to get back to where we were in the 90s. Uh, there I am. That's my fourth day of work. It's his fourth day of work, too. Um, we both, well, actually, he's got different, more different hair than I do. I shouldn't have said that. We're streamlining, aren't we? Uh, I'm actually going to see the president tomorrow to give him my book. Um, and he's not going to agree with all of it, by the way. I'll get to that in a minute. But we came in, and all that drama had happened. By the way, for the t purposes of time, I've, I'm skipping over the drama that Russia initiated. August 1998, the financial collapse, uh, the two Chechen wars, the invasion of Georgia. They, they were doing some things, too, that made things more uh, uh, confrontational and, and building autocracy during those eight years of the Putin presidency. But when we came in, we wanted to reset things. Perezagruska, for those that speak Russian. Um, and we sat down with the president. We told him about all the stories. You know, well, you know, we're not cooperating in this because of this and that and some cultural thing. There were people that wanted to argue about, you know, Russians are destined to be in, t in tension with us. And... President-elect Obama first, and then President Obama said, hey, I don't really get it. Like, don't Russians and, uh, want to reduce the number of nuclear weapons in the world? And it's like, yes, Mr. President, actually, we think they do. That's good. Don't they want to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? Answer to that is yes. So why is it that we can seek not concessions, Professor Cohen? We never use the word concessions. I think that's a bad word in diplomacy. Uh, like you said, nobody has any friends, nobody does any favors. Every country and every leader is seeking to obtain, to pursue their national interests as defined by them. My, one of my beasts with Putin is he defines it in bad ways, I think, not just for America, but for Russians themselves. Let's leave that aside for now. But P uh, Obama's idea, we're not going to get to yes unless they think it's in their interest. Uh, and so let's look for things that are what he called, and he used this phrase many, many times in dealing with both Medvedev and Obama, win-win outcomes. We're not seeking any concessions. We're seeking win-win outcomes. And, you know, read the book for the details. I'll just go through this quickly. But I was there. Uh, we got a lot of big things done. And I want to remind you, if you've never served in government, it's hard to do anything in government. My God, I, I only was there for five years. Most of the time, you just stand in place. You just be. You, the bureaucratic process uh, drags you down. There are other actors, right? They all get a vote. Russia, China, Iran, they get a vote. And a lot of times, you're just like pulling your hair, doing nothing. Um, uh, you're being. You're not doing. But there was a period where we did some big things. This was a great day for me. 
This is Prague, 2010. We're signing the START Treaty. We are reducing nuclear weapons. It was not an arms race. We were reducing nuclear weapons that were allowed in the, the two countries' arsenals by 30%. That's a big thing. Vice President would say that's a big, and then add the adjective, begins with F. Uh, that was a big thing. In fact, and then ratification, something that's pretty hard these days in American politics. That's the day we ratified the START Treaty. That was a big, a big deal, too. We got some other things done. As Professor Cohen mentioned, we opened up the Northern Distribution Network. We went from 2% to over 60% of our supplies going through Russia and Central Asia. That was, for us, designed to reduce our dependency on Pakistan, because 90% of our supply routes went through Pakistan at the time. And we had an idea that we were going to bring our war of terror, we, we, uh, war against terrorists, we called it something different, but that's what it was. We plan to violate the sovereignty of Pakistan, as we, you all know now. And we did it one time in a very dramatic way when we killed Osama bin Laden in 2011. That could not have happened without NDN being in place. Russia and the United States were cooperating. And I disagree that NDN was a concession. I disagree with that because we, and in fact, I remember very vividly, we were at April 1st, 2009. We were in London, first meeting with Medvedev, and he had just, if you remember, announced that Russia is entitled to its privileged sphere of influence. That's the phrase he used. And at that time, literally, if it's April, it was February, February 2009, President Bakiev had just come to Moscow, uh, met with Prime Minister Putin, not Medvedev, he uh, received a $2 billion economic assistance package. Um, uh, later, it turned out to be incredibly corrupt, uh, as we learned later. Corrupt with American money, too, Mr. Bakiev was. He took money from both sides in a corrupt way. Uh, but the quid pro quo for that is you have to close Manas Air Base, which at that time, over 90% of our soldiers used as a staging ground before going into Afghanistan, in Kyrgyzstan. So we sat down with uh, Medvedev. We sat down. The president sat down with Medvedev, and I was at the table taking notes. OK, let's be clear about that. And you don't know about this, because we didn't read it out this way, because we didn't know where this was going to go. I, I was the guy that read out that meeting, senior administration official, SAOs. That, that was my job during these meetings. But here's what the president said. He said, look, he likes that word, look, I'm the new guy. This sphere of influence thing, you know, it feels kind of 19th century to me. Uh, I don't really get it, like how having Kyrgyzstan in your sphere of influence, that's good for you, but if we have it, it's good for us. He just explained very straightforwardly, what do we do at Manas? We have our soldiers take hot showers, they get some sleep, they eat some hot food, and then they don't do anything in Kyrgyzstan, they're out at the base, uh, every now and then they do and, and, and cause some troubles. I had to deal with that uh, when I was at the White House. They're not there for regime change and meddling. They're out by the airport, and then they get on airplanes, and they go to forward operating bases, and they go and pursue and kill terrorists, Al-Qaeda and Taliban, that want to also kill you. Mr. He didn't, uh, this is, I'm paraphrasing, right? Obviously, President Obama would never talk this crudely as I am. But the point was, we have a common enemy here. This is helping us fight that war, that win-win outcome. Oh, and by the way, we're buying a billion dollars of fuel from you at Manas. Yeah, a billion dollars worth. Check it out. It's in my book. And he tried to say, isn't that a win-win outcome, this sphere of influence thing? If we close Manas, does that make you better off? And for the next six years, Manas stayed open as, as a vital piece of NDM. Third, Iran, sanctions. That was tougher. Professor Cohen, you're right about sanctions on Iran. That was tougher. And in fact, at that same Prague meeting that I just showed you, uh, all the pomp and circumstance, drinking champagne, that was all fun. The substance of that meeting was about Iran. And President Medvedev said to President Obama, he said, look, and by the way, at the, at the, the press conference for the signing of that, that, the signing ceremony, right at the end, President Medvedev said, uh, uh, in English, he said, most certainly, Barack, this is a win-win outcome for both of our countries. He, para he was echoing what he had heard from Obama many times. When we got behind closed doors, he said, hey, this isn't a win-win for us. 
We got trade with this country. We got, we got more there. We've signed an agreement to sell them the S-300s. This is not. This is asymmetric. You guys got nothing going on. And President Obama, as I write about in the book, said two things. He said, one, I hear you, and we're going to lift some sanctions on some of your countries to make this easier for you. And we did that. And we're going to deliver the one, two, three agreement so that we can cooperate on nuclear energy. We did that. And then he made a much bolder argument. He said, in the long run, I want you to think that your bilateral relationship with my country will be more valuable than your bilateral relationship with Iran. And that's how we got the Security Council resolution we did. And then in a cooperative win-win way, sitting with the Russians, you don't get the Iran deal without the Russians involved, we got a great deal, a fantastic deal, that tragically our president has just torn up this week. Finally, on security results, history can't just be about the things you see. They have to also be about non-events. These get written out of history. And for me, the greatest, scariest non-event of my time at the White House was when the Bakiev, the president I just described to you from Kyrgyzstan, he was overthrown. He fled to Belarus. 100 people were killed. 300,000 ethnic Uzbeks went into Uzbekistan. And it felt like we were on the verge of a color revolution, but this was tinged with ethnic genocidal civil war. That's what it felt like. I was scared to death because I thought that was going to be on our watch, we in the Obama administration. But you didn't read about that because it didn't happen because... Back then, in the heyday of the reset, President Obama called President Medvedev and said, you don't have an interest and we don't have an interest in thinking of this in a zero-sum way. Let's work together with our size to try to move this in the right direction. And in fact, the former transitional president, she was just out to see me last week, Rosa Atambayeva, uh, we were recalling it last week, uh, we agreed on that, that this would be a good outcome, a transitional president, by the way. It could have been a model for other places at other times which I'll get to in a minute. I'll go faster about these things. Uh, I just want to remind you, this is not ancient history, folks. This is five or six years ago. These are Russian and Americans jumping out of planes in uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, Professor Cohn went over this list. I won't go over it, but we did all these things. And this was win-win. This is not zero sum. Uh, when Boeing is investing in Russia, they're hiring Russian scientists. That's a win-win. That's good for Boeing. That's good for Russia. All of these things, I would argue, were good for both sides. And, and by the way, about WTO uh, uh, accession, it's a fair point. Not everybody has supported it. But the government of Russia was our negotiating team. Like, they were elected. That, that, you know, you have to abide. If they're signing the agreement, well, you know, who is it for us to say they shouldn't be signing that agreement? That, that's their decision to join the WTO. That wasn't our decision, but we helped them to do that. And then finally on the, the good news, and then I'm going to turn to the bad news and end. Um, just remember, five or six years ago, over 60% of Russians, you know, you, you see the peak there, had a positive view of the United States of America and vice versa. That was just five years ago. And my point is, all of that stuff happened after NATO expansion, after the Iraq War, after the Orange Revolution. So you can't use these variables, to go back to my political science jargon, to explain our current conflict without having a theory for that cooperation that I just described. All these things happened, and they didn't get in the way of the list of things that I just described you for. In fact, NATO expansion. I was on every single phone call with the president when I worked at the White House, every single meeting he had with both Medvedev and Putin, and I attended most of the meetings that they had uh, when I was ambassador. NATO expansion never came up once, not one single time. And you know why? Because it wasn't an issue during this period. Our Republican conservative critics blamed us that it wasn't an issue. I just want to remind you, you know, we, we should have Bob Kagan in this debate too. So we have a, a, a triangle here. But it wasn't because we weren't, nobody was talking about, when we got to the government, nobody was talking about Georgian membership into NATO. NATO didn't want it. Nobody was talking about Ukrainian membership into NATO. The Ukrainians didn't want it. Even Yushchenko didn't want it. We went there in the summer of 2009. There was no support for that in Ukraine. They were focused on the EU. After Yanukovych wins, the issue was dead. So that gets me to what I think was the driver of the end of the reset and the, the real moment that we're in today. All right, two big events, two big events. One, 
as Professor Cohen already described, Putin decides to come back as president, September 2011, I remember it vividly. I was already going through confirmation hearings and then suddenly it's like, okay, now, now I'm gonna be working with a different government. Um, uh, and then the demonstrations in Russia, 2011-2012. I actually went in to brief the president a couple of days after Putin announced that he was gonna run for president. And uh, it was about something else. Then he pulled me back in and he said, well, what do you think? Like, what are we gonna do? And I, being ever the optimist, I said, well, Mr. President, you know, you've dealt with Medvedev, he's close to you, but, uh, you know, Putin, we're gonna have to deal with him. We have our interests, we're gonna engage with him. We've engaged before. And remember, Putin's always been the big dog, right? The, the conventional wisdom was always Putin's in charge, that Medvedev's just this puppet, and so there should be continuity, right? And the president looked at me and said, come on, man. I don't, I, I shouldn't, I don't want to put words into the mouth of the president. He looked at me skeptically and he said, you know that this is going to be a big change. And, and, I, and I agreed with him because we saw these two gentlemen up close and personal. And it turns out they had pretty radically different views of the world. Medvedev was a young guy, 10 years younger, 10 years less living in the Soviet Union. Lawyer. He had lots of affinity, lots of overlap with Obama. Putin, much older, trained in the KGB, and his analytic framework was formed then. And these are the things he saw. Uh, sees things in zero-sum terms, not win-win, plus two for America, minus two for Russia. We are a competitor for him, not a partner. Uh, uh, and and that, that tendency wasn't there at the beginning, and maybe in questions we can talk about this. I think it's grossly oversimplified to think in 2000 Putin had this worldview. It evolved over time. But the third one's the most important, and I'm gonna end on this. Um, he has a view of America that, uh, a theory, hypothesis, uh, that we use overt and covert power to overthrow regimes we don't like. And there's a lot of empirical data to support that hypothesis that Mr. Putin has about American foreign policy over the last 70 years. War in Iraq, Serbia, 2000. And we actually sat down and we debated it with him. Uh, July 2009, about, well, this went on for about three and a half hours, and he went through all the list of all the terrible things we had done for him. He was ready, baby. He came prepared. He had his every point and, and you know, going through all the terrible, awful things that Bush had done to him. Not Bush, actually, the Bush administration. He liked President Bush. It was the Bush administration, the deep state. That, they were the one causing all the trouble. And they got to Iraq, and he went on about how stupid that was horrible, all the gr horrible things that had happened. And the president, who had listened to him by now by, for 58 minutes, and so thank you for being good listeners too, to the two of us, uh, he looked at him and he said, you're right, I agree with you. And Putin was like, hey, hold on, you're the Americans. What, what do you mean you agree with me? He didn't say that, but he, he was kind of startled by that. Like, why isn't he talking about the continuity in, in American policy? And Obama was saying, no, I'm different. I don't believe in regime change. I, you may not know this, Mr. Prime Minister, I was against that war long before it was popular to be against that war. And as we walked out to the cars, you know, I could hear in Putin's voice thinking, well, maybe this guy is different. Uh, maybe we will have a different kind of relationship. But he said, I'm done dealing with you guys. I've been there, done that with Bush. Go knock yourself out with Prime Minister, uh, uh, President Putin. And then, Two years later, a bunch of things happened. Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Russia. These are the events that led to the current confrontation. By the way, on Libya, I was with, uh, in the room with President Medvedev in the Kremlin when he agreed to abstain on that UN Security Council resolution that Professor Cohen uh, talked about, um, and he knew he knew that that was going to lead to our use of military force. First time in history that Russia or the Soviet Union had agreed to that. Two days later, once that resolution passed, Prime Minister Putin for the first time ever criticized him for that because he thought that Medvedev had gone too far in being cooperative with us. And I think, in retrospect, that was the beginning of the end of the reset for us. But this was the punctuation mark. Because in all of these events, Putin never believed that, that Democrats themselves would organize. He always thought 
It's the CIA behind that, right? We overthrew Mubarak. We, we did this, we did that, we did that. And especially this was dramatic and consequential for him because the last time that it happened was 20 years earlier when the Soviet Union collapsed, an event he called the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. And remember, he's running for president during those demonstrations. Those were demonstrations about a falsified election. And so he needed a new narrative to say that these people are criminals, they're, they're patsies, they're traitors, they are under our, our skin, and they begin to blame us. America, Obama, and when I got there, me personally. And so I'll skip through this. We can, we can go through it and you can read the book. But that's when he decided that we were to blame. We were the fomenters of these revolutions. And I just want to state for the record on the facts, we were not giving money to the opposition. I was not handing out money to Navalny. That is not true. I was not uh, the, the McFall girls. These are the, the various opposition leaders that, that I supposedly was funding. Here's some more. You've heard of disinformation? Well, I was the target of a lot of disinformation at this time. Here I am allegedly campaigning for Navalny on the right. And here I am organizing the demonstrations in May 6, 2012, that you may recall ended violently. This was actually the low point. Uh, no, it's not funny. Please don't laugh. It's not funny. This is February 2012. This was put out. Of course, you know, oh, we have a free press, and we had nothing to do with it. Of course, of course. We got it pulled down. YouTube, we, I, have, I had some friends at Google. We got it pulled down. And it reappeared and reappeared and reappeared tweeted out, you go on Yandex now and you put pedophile McFall in Yandex, four million uh, um, um, uh, search, uh, um, what do you call it, um, thank you, come up. So, and it wasn't just me, this is another thing from Russian television at that time, uh, comparing Barack Hussein Obama to the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, same ideology. All of this stuff, we didn't change the reset, we didn't change one thing. Not one thing in our policy. The thing we had adopted in 2009 was what we were doing at this time. What changed was Putin inside the government and this mobilization against what he thought was his national interest. And then the last straw, which has already been mentioned, uh, the fall of Yanukovych in February uh, 2004. I've been speaking for 30 minutes? Oh my God! Oh, then I'm gonna stop. I'll stop with this, because Professor Cohen mentioned it. I'm sorry about that, guys. I thought we were, well, I, didn't, I was not paying attention. So, Yavin um, Abatoje. This event, right? There was a debate whether they should join the accession agreement or not. Our view, just so you know, and I argued it, was you can join as many agreements as you want. Knock yourselves out. America's part of, of dozens, maybe dozen, tens of dozens of trade agreements. As long as they don't get in the way of each other, why shouldn't the sovereign country of Ukraine have the right to choose who they want to trade with? That's their choice, not Russia's choice. Russia doesn't get a veto about what Ukraine does. But then Yanukovych made his decision. And there was this guy, Mustafa Naim is his name. He said, this, this guy, I think he even used the word svolich. He said, who is he to say what we should do? And if you are with me, come to the streets of Maidan, and we're going to push for Ukraine to be part of Europe. And that's when it, what happened in Maidan. Mustafa Naim did it. It wasn't Joe Biden. It wasn't Toria Newland. It wasn't Barack Obama. His name's Mustafa Naim. I just saw him 10 days ago in, in Ukraine. And then this thing got violent. People were killed. And that's when we intervene. We should have been involved earlier. Maybe we'll talk about that. And we, with Europeans, tried to cut a deal between the opposition and Mr. Yanukovych, President Yanukovych. Poor Joe Biden on the phone, back and forth, trying to get a deal to avoid bloodshed and push new elections to the future. February 21st, we got a deal. Big, I was in Sochi, I remember my Blackberry was blowing up. This is a great victory for uh, American diplomacy. Six hours later, Yanukovych shows up in Rostov. And for reasons I still am, uh, are mysterious to me, but they weren't mysterious to Putin. That was us, that was the CIA again, and overthrowed his ally, and that's when he decided to annex Crimea, and when that was cheap, he decided to annex, uh, uh, not to annex, to, to support those uh, separatists in eastern um, Ukraine. And to me, that is the cause of our current conflict with Russia, Putin, in reaction, I actually agree with Professor Cohen, he, is a, he reacts to these things, but there's some pretty horrible reactions. Annexation, supporting Assad, one of the worst uh, killers in, a, in the world today. Intervening in our elections, that did not even happen during the Cold War. Those are the ways he reacts, and then therefore, I think, 
it's appropriate that we have to tragically push back on those things. Thank you for your patience. Thanks. OK, thanks to both our speakers. Um, as you can see, we stuck really tightly to the logistics that I laid out of 15 <laughs> minutes for each speaker. Um, and if Steve's going to tout his daughter, I will say my daughter has been doing a tech crew this year. So this was a really fast, smooth uh, stage change here for a bunch of academics. So that we were able to do this this quickly. So uh, OK, what we're going to do now, and I am going to keep the speakers to this, yes. is we're going to give them each five minutes to respond to what was said by the others. So we're gonna start off with Professor Cohen. He's gonna have five minutes and then five minutes for Professor McFall. And then we're gonna start with the questions from the audience and from online as well. So, Professor Cohen. I apologize to everyone in the room, including Professor McFall, for speaking too long. And for just- And I do too, by the way. Yeah. We've saved you about tea. <laughs> we're both at fault. Yeah, TV and about. Um, <laughs> I just make a couple corrective remarks, and then I want to ask Professor McFall a question, and he can have all the collective time uh, given to both of us. Um, the pedophile thing is horrible. There's no justifying it. But let me point out that in the London Review of Books, the editors permitted a very well-known, very well-known American uh, Canadian writer on Russia to call Putin a pedophile. This is the kind of thing that obviously no decent person is associated with, but it's what Cold War brings upon us. We've seen it before. Um, Jackson Vanek, yeah, but you replaced it with Magnitsky, which was worse. You had a chance. You had a chance to end sanctions, and look where we are now. Now the START Treaty. I know you know, and I don't think you're being deceitful. But I wonder if you and Obama understood that you put a time bomb under the START Treaty with this missile defense stuff. The Russians thought they had a commitment from you that you would not deploy missile defense. Other, well, that's what they said. Well, I mean, this okay. That's not true. It's All right, let me just finish my point, yeah, go ahead. and then you go ahead. But stop and think where we're at. As long as we send these missile defense installations to ring Russia on land and sea, Russia isn't going to give up its nuclear arsenals or cut it very much. So I think President Obama, when he came back, and in order to get Senate ratification, signed that letter to the Senate that he would pursue missile defense to the maximum. I'm correct about that. He didn't show leadership. He should have fought. And now my question, and I stopped, Professor McFall. I don't understand, Michael, what you mean. But it's very important because of my conception of what went wrong. When you say, if I understood you, that the reset was conceived as a way to return to the 1990s, because in my mind, almost everything that went wrong began in the 1990s. So if you can explain that, or if I misunderstood, it seems to me to be to go right to the disagreements between us. Great. I'll, I'll be really quick, I hope. So first of all, Jackson Vanek, yes, that was true. Uh, Magnitsky, we signed. Uh, I, and I defend the Magnitsky. Uh, people that commit human rights abuses in Russia do not have the right to get a visa to come to our country. I'm sorry. You don't get a right. It's not in our Constitution that you have a right to do that. We do that with all other countries all over the world, by the way. If you're a human rights abuser, we track that. Uh, it got codified in this way that maybe was more in their face. It, it, but but it, you know, if you're part of a wrongful death and it is proven and we went through the work to do that, you do not have a right to go to Disneyland, in my view. On the START Treaty, uh, there, we did not promise limits on missile defense. I was part of the negotiating team. Uh, we knew, just because you, for exactly the reason you said, we could not do that because we wouldn't have get Senate ratification. But what we also knew, and we, we talked to them about, missile defense deployments that we have made uh, in Europe can do nothing against Russian ICBMs. Nothing. They have, th this is a question of physics. It's not a question of opinion, okay? And in fact, we were so eager to show credible commitment to that, we actually changed the interceptor. We, Bush was going to put 10 GBIs, 10 GBIs, by the way, nothing, uh, against their arsenal. GBIs, if you re rearm them, can actually attack Russia in an offensive way. We took them out. 
We replaced them with SM3s. <coughs> SM3s have no way to catch Russian ICBMs in Poland. The best place to put interceptors if you want to shoot down warheads, remember you don't shoot down missiles, another misconception, is not in the chase because they can't catch up. They're in Alaska. And that's where we did our deployment of GBIs. We have 44 there. And putting them there, 44, right? Remember, they have the, the right to 1,550 warheads. So we're not going to protect ourselves in some ways. We, we don't want them to disarm. We want it to maintain, euphemistically, we called it strategic stability, otherwise known as mutual assured destruction. Um, and then finally, I'm glad you raised, uh, uh, by the way, we also took the radar out of the Czech Republic, the EMR, and put them closer to Iran so that they didn't have capability with Russian ICBMs. That was a huge concession that our critics criticized us for. And I'm, I actually misspoke, I'm glad you brought it up, not return to the 90s, return to a time when we were seeking win-win outcomes. You and I probably have a disagreement about some of those win-win outcomes in the 90s, but what I meant was that, if you look at President Obama's speech, and I really, really ear, ear, urge you to look at it, he actually talked about the 90s, his big speech on Russia, July 2009, where he acknowledged that that was a horrible time for Russia. He was the first president ever to say that. He went on for two paragraphs, by the way, about May 9th. Go read the speech, it's there, you don't have to believe me. And he said, and it was very controversial in our White House, he said, I believe a strong, prosperous Russia is in American national interest. No president had ever said that before. Okay, all right, thanks to both of you. I'm gonna turn it over to Alex, who's gonna take some of the questions that we have from the audience. Okay, the first one is going to go to Professor Cohen. Um, so, uh, it's actually about going beyond Russia's security interests. Um, what are the legitimate security interests of Ukraine or Georgia? Their, what are their legitimate interests? Security interests. Security interest. interests. Well, they certainly haven't achieved any with their unwise policies. So the first thing to do is rethink that. They're certainly not very secure today. I don't know how you define security interests. I would say that for small countries like that, the absence of foreign bases in its country is the first step toward that. Uh, I would think that making peace with its neighbors diplomatically gives them the security at once. Those two countries need a stable, uh, non-militarized environment to prosper. I don't think Russia's a threat to them. I don't think we're a threat to them. What's happening is, is that, uh, as in the other Cold War, but now it's in Europe, not in Africa, uh, we've got proxy wars breaking out all over the place, uh, including in Syria. So I would argue if I were a politician in Ukraine, or some, how many Ukraines exist today, I'm not sure, or in Georgia, that the first commandment uh, of security for my country is it will not take part in proxy wars. So I, I was just in Ukraine two weeks ago. I, I don't know, uh, uh, and I just wanna make sure that when you're in Ukraine, Russia still f certainly feels like a threat. Uh, they have annexed territory. They have supported separatists with weapons, and they have supported separatists with their own soldiers. Over 10,000 people have died. It feels, when you're in Kiev, that you are at war with Russia. So it feels like a legitimate threat that needs to be dealt with. And by the way, I could be wrong on this. The only foreign base that's in Ukraine today is a Russian base. Okay, and this one is going to go to... Um Ambassador McFall. So this is from Alexis Lerner, who's a PhD student at the University of Toronto and visiting scholar here at Columbia. And it's about the impact of sanctions on student exchanges. Mm. The State Department raised its travel advisory in March to level three. Diplomats have been evacuated on both sides and schools around the nation have ended their Russia study abroad programs. Considering the barriers that these decisions pose to student engagement in Russia, what avenues remain for young people to improve or get involved with US-Russia relations? And just for me to editorialize on that, isn't this one of the ways in which we're uh, shooting ourselves in the foot with some of these uh, sanctions. Yes, yep. uh, I, totally do, I totally agree. I, I, I emphatically uh, agree that it was a giant mistake for the State Department to raise that level because that meant 
for concretely for Stanford University, because of our rules, we cannot send our students to St. Petersburg this, this fall as it was planned. That was a giant mistake. Uh, I, I urge them to roll it back. But I want to remind you that Putin also is rolling back these things. He closed down. Any, any Flex alumni here by the chance? Uh, any, uh, yeah, uh, great program, fantastic program. Uh, he shut that down. I, I agree the more connectivity between our societies, um, the better our countries will be. Uh, even when we disagree on, on big things, the more interaction we have between our societies, I think the better off we'll be. Thank you. Okay, um, so we have a question from Twitter, which is from at Lusco Claudio, uh, which is essentially the question is about the usefulness of the term Cold War at this particular time. So if there's no competition between rival political ideologies, the international system is no longer bipolar, there's a huge discrepancy between the size of the economies, what leverage are we essentially getting from this term, a new Cold War? Um, and is it, are we overusing this term because we don't have in international relations, because we don't have in the, in the punditry, we don't have in the vernacular, a better term for describing something that is uh, different in these ways from previously? Sure we do, it's the hot, it's the hot piece, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Cohen, you want Professor to Professor Cohen. You know, I, I learned a lot of things uh, reading a Professor McFall's book, but I learned something absolutely startling here today from him when he said that Obama begin sentences, look. And of course, you know, many Russians begin sentences, vidish. So it's kind of good to know. Interesting. I mean, you could have built on that, I think, okay. to create an entire... <laughs> we the, tried the, to milk the, the name of his daughter as much as we could, just so you know, uh, um, Sasha. Can, what was the question? Sorry, what was yeah, the yeah, question? I, sorry. Who was it to? Just, just one word. Yeah, I mean, there was a question, how does Dr. Co how do you, how does Dr. Cohen oh, yeah, define I got it. I got it. Right. the new so, Cold War? So look, I'm the wrong and the right person to ask. Beginning in the 1990s, during the strategic partnership with Russia, so-called, I began warning in my writings that we were creating a very cold peace and it could become a new Cold War. This was in the 90s. In the early 2000s, I was calling it a new Cold War. I was widely criticized, mostly with references made here, that where's the ideology? Well. Professor McFall and I see the ideology emerging now. I mean, this so-called conservative, reactionary, traditional Russia against the liberal, enlightened West. It's misformulated, but certainly an enormous ideological uh, component has emerged in the last year or two, or maybe a little longer. We just had to be patient. As for Russia not being strong, Russia is plenty strong to fight a Cold War, and if it comes to that, a hot war, where the new Cold War has unfolded, that in regions where it has enormous advantages, its own geopolitical area, look what it did in Syria. I mean, the newspapers tell us today, or Trump tells us today, we destroyed ISIS in Syria. This is utter nonsense. And I fear, Michael, that during Obama's time in office, the Islamic State just took more and more territory in Syria until Putin intervened. And people say that's an apology for Putin. And no, you know what it is? Putin formulated that question right when he talked to Obama several times about it. And he said, choose. Who do you want in Damascus? Assad or the Islamic State? And I personally preferred Assad. Because if nothing else, Assad is the protector of the Jews and the Christians whereas the Islamic State was very busy chopping off their heads. I didn't think there was much choice here. And why Obama couldn't have agreed with Putin on that one crucial element and left us, left us with this catastrophe that we have today, I don't understand. He, above all, President Obama, should have understood what was at stake there. And so when you ask uh, about the elements of the new Cold War, if that's not Cold War, I don't know what is. So I'm going to skip the Cold War piece. I mean, uh, I, I, we tend to agree. I, I would, in nuances, uh, it's similar but different. Uh, but let me do respond to this piece about Syria because um, uh, the longest chapter in my book is about Syria. And it has to be long because it's tragic. And I think we made some mistakes. And I won't go through them all now. But I will, I have a somewhat different interpretation uh, of those conversations. And I was there for several of them. 
2011 happened. Remember, there were peaceful demonstrations in Syria. People forget this. Long before you'd ever heard of, of ISIS. Um, and and in, in Tunisia and in Egypt. And when we sat down with Putin, in, in fact, the, 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 that photo that I showed you of them looking very dour, that was in Los Cabos, Mexico. And that's when we spent over an hour and a half just talking about Syria. And they had different analytic frameworks for how to deal with this problem. The president said to Putin, he said, Vidish, look, uh, I don't know if he said that, but um, <laughs> he said, we didn't cause this thing. We had nothing to do with it. But our assessment is, right, our analytic assessment is that if Assad stays and there's not some political agreement, two things are going to happen. This is our theory of the case. And I was a part of this, by the way, as a social scientist filling in this theory. I'd actually written about this as a, as a PhD student 4,000 4, years ago. If you don't get agreement now, when it's peaceful, two things are going to happen. It's going to get violent, and terrorists are going to show up. The extremists are going to show up. And the peaceful folks are going to disappear. We didn't know they were going to be slaughtered and killed, but they're going to disappear from the arena. So our argument to Putin, work with us now to try to get that, agreement, that kind of agreement. And that's what we chase the Russians around for the next two years. My t the title of that book, that chapter is called Chasing Russians, Failing Syrians. Putin had a different theory. He said, you guys are naive about the Middle East. You don't understand these societies. These are, these are conservative societies. What they need to modernize, and by the way, he said this about Assad and Mubarak, so it wasn't choosing sides. This was his theory about how change comes about, is you need a strong hand to push them forward. Mubarak was at and Assad was at. Those were, that was the exchange we had in Los Cabos. Fast forward to the future. Our theory, Obama's theory was right. That's exactly what happened, tragically, exactly what happened. Assad stayed, doubled down, terrorists from all over the world flew in, not just ISIS, all over the world, including many thousands from Russia, by the way. Uh, and things got polarized. The, op the, the, the moderate opposition disappeared and, and went into exile. And Assad, you know, like Putin said, use a strong hand. I, my own th theory is that he thinks of Chechnya as the way to deal with terrorists. That's how you deal with terrorists, and that's what he thinks his guy did there, and he thought that Assad was doing it. But Assad wasn't winning. And that's when Putin went from theoretician to actor and then intervene in Syria to prop up his guy. They did not fight ISIS. That is just not true. They avoided ISIS for two to three years. And in 2014, Operation Inherent Resolve, we went in and fought ISIS on the other side of the river. You can go look at the maps. We fought them for three years, and thankfully, the Trump administration continued that. They barely went over on that side. ISIS was over there. Other terrorists were on the other side. That's true. Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, they fought them. ISIS was our fight. Now we're left with a terrible stalemate. We've achieved victory on one side out in the east. Assad has achieved victory on his side. Uh, and there is not a resolution for how you now get this country back together. Okay, um, we've, had a, we've had a bunch of comments come in on Twitter in the last minute here, um, reacting to Professor Cohen to some of the comments you've just made about, um, in, in general, building on this idea of whether or not Russia is entitled to a buffer zone, a security zone, uh, outside of it and the threat that it poses to its neighbors. So I just would get, want to give you a chance a little bit more. We've gotten questions, so we have one from, which I think is coming from uh, the NYU viewing perhaps, but from a, a student at NYU, Ben Dalton. Shouldn't the independent states of Eastern Europe have the freedom to enter any security association they wish and, that, and, and then should they be able to enter the, any security thing? So I guess, how do you balance between the sovereignty of the states of Eastern Europe, and even if we want to push forward in the sovereignty of states in Ukraine and Georgia, and this trigger that, that we've talked about here today of Russia feeling threatened by encroachment, uh, by the possibility of, of the, the reality of some of these states joining NATO, and then the possibility of some of the others seeking to join NATO in the future. How do we draw that line? How do we draw that balance? How do you draw it in thinking about it? Well, it's Vapros, Vaprosov, isn't it? It's the question of all questions. If we can solve this problem of how you reconcile two forces in the world, we could make peace. Fetish, we all would agree. Um, I can only give you bullet point answers. Russia is entitled, not only Russia, but we're talking about Russia, 
just as we have claimed an entitlement to absence of foreign military bases on its borders. Now, what that means in the age of missiles needs to be elaborated, and it's a separate discussion. But let's remember the Monroe Doctrine, uh, which we continue <laughs> to lay claim to. The second point I'll make will upset a lot of people, but I believe, and by the way, it's the job of historians to keep an eye on the accounts of people who are in the room. In other words, we will use McFall's book when we write the history of this period, but not only his book. Correct. And <laughs> First <we will> draft, <laughs> not the last draft of history. Okay. So I hear him relating some narratives with which I profoundly disagree, but I don't think we, could get, we should get bogged down in that. So let me make this point. The question has become, and remain, was it wise to expand NATO the way we did? And the way we did was take in anybody basically who wanted to be in. And that's what we're doing now. You know, do this, this, and this, and come on in. And this is entirely wrong, provocative, and undermines our own security. NATO is not a non-selective sorority. It is not the American Association of Retired People which my 26-year-old daughter can join for $12 and get all sorts of discounts on rent cars NATO is a security organization, and its sole purpose, to the extent that it had a purpose and have, has one, is to provide security for its original members. Every time it takes in a nation that is not only unqualified, but has conflicts that could drag NATO and all of us into war. It undermines our security. So then you say, what do you do about a country? Let's say, uh, I don't think the Baltic countries are threatened by Russia, but let's say Latvia is. Do you think Russia is threatened by the Baltic states? No, I don't okay. think there's any let's threat. Let's remember how that looks when you're in Estonia. It's kind of odd to think. Right. Well, Estonia is threatening Russia? Come I, on. No, 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 Russia is a great power. Excuse me. Latvia says every day, oh my God, oh my God, the Russians are coming, right? And then we say, okay, here's another division. And now we can hit St. Petersburg with ordinary artillery, not missiles, ordinary artillery. You and I know St. Petersburg. That's a little different in our lifetime, Michael. Wouldn't you agree? But Russian artillery can hit those countries too, Professor Cohen. Just be clear. <laughs> they have tremendous <laughs> military capability that goes the other way. Yeah, how... It takes two to tango. If wait, you want to disarm, that's great, but wait, Russia wait, has wait, to do wait, it wait, too. Wait. But how did, how, how did NATO get on that territory? That's the very point. How did it get from Berlin to where it can hit Latvia? Because democratic uh, societies chose who they wanted to associate with. That should be the way it works. Okay. All right, okay. There's so, def definitely respectful differences of opinion here. <laughs> Um, we're going to switch, we're going to change, uh, change up the topic on this okay. because we're r quickly running out of time. Yeah, quickly running out of time. Um, both uh, Professor Cohen and Professor McFall did such thorough jobs sort of walking us through the 20 and 25 year history that we had um, in the post-Cold War period, which is kind of amazing. Uh, but it didn't leave a lot of time for talking about the current situation between the two countries right now. So we're going to start with a uh, provocative question, which came from our audience here at Columbia which is directed to Ambassador McFaul, but we'll let, um, we'll let both people weigh in on it. Uh, do you believe Putin has compromise on Trump? <laughs> you can answer that however you want to answer that. Let's go back to NATO. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually not gonna answer that question because I don't know and I want Mr. Mueller and his team to figure it out. And I don't, I, I never want to get ahead of the skis of the facts. Here's a couple of things I do know about how uh, Putin operates and uh, what I think has already been proven. Uh, we disagree about the, the facts of 2016. I don't think it's an alleged Watergate. Uh, well, maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, Professor Cohen. Let me just say what I believe. Russia intervened in our presidential election to impact the outcome in a certain way. Putin very rationally wanted candidate Trump to succeed and candidate Clinton to fail. He looked at what they were talking about, and if I were Putin, I would want that too. What was audacious and wrong, and I, you know, wake up America, I can't believe how asleep at the wheel we are about this, is that he used 
incredible capacity, cyber capacity. They have incredible capacities, second maybe only to the United States and catching up fast, to go and steal data as they did. Uh, and then leak it to WikiLeaks in a way that was designed to hurt one of the candidates. That to me is clear as day. The evidence is there. Number two. Please, 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 please. please, uh -uh. please. We're going to leave it to you. We're glad. No. Hold on, hold on. Prasnikan. We're going to limit this to the people at the stage. I would just encourage. Okay, I'm going to ask okay. the audience to please Lying be respectful and moves. quiet. Okay. Otherwise, we will ask you to leave okay. the room. Thank you. I'm. Hey, I, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Thanks. I think, so I'm going to put it in opinion so that we don't have to be screamed at. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming. I know some of those people that gathered that evidence, part of the government. Um, and you can believe what you want, but I actually think facts matter in debates, as President Cohen said. And we, I believe that those facts are overwhelming. All right. And we uh, we are we are right. limiting Thank this. Thank you. Let, and you can come exactly. have your own. You, you know, you can go have your own event another day. Okay. Right. Um, number two, there also was intervention in terms of uh, information and and support. You know, should Russia. Russian entities be allowed to buy ads on Facebook? I'm not sure they should be allowed to do that. Uh, I, I'm a big America first guy. I'm a sovereignty guy. I don't want, I wouldn't want us to do that. I, I most certainly would not want us to do that in Russia. And so they did those things. I, I think that is rather overwhelming what they did. And now I've already forgot the, uh, the question. Compromise. That's right, comrade. Maybe that's all I need to say. <laughs> okay. okay. Professor Cohen. Buy the book, folks, and then argue with me on Twitter. I guarantee you I'll respond there, but not here. How we have a that? question about that, too, coming up. Guys, guys, I mean, the problem is, is that when you interrupt Professor McFall, it's not proper, but also you chew up my time. <laughs> and you might <laughs> let, let, let me handle it, okay? <laughs> I have a little trust. Uh, I have no idea about the compromise, and I don't think we should yeah, degrade, that. degrade universities by even talking about it. Um, but this whole Watergate, they intervened in our election, trampled on our sovereignty. Uh, this is hyperbolic until we get some evidence, and there is none, at least. Okay, we're just going to agree to disagree, well, right? I haven't formulated yeah. I'm okay. going to agree in a, formulate a way you can agree. Okay, it's great. Just, I'm rabbinical, and it takes me a while to get there. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going. I apologize. Keep going. And as we say in my faith, if you don't like the answer, I'll find you another rabbi. <laughs> um, every day I read in the papers, Russia meddled, interfered in our 2015 presidential elections. I'm shocked, shocked, shocked. Of course they did. Meddling in the other's elections began when, or internal affairs, began when Woodrow Wilson sent, I think, 33 American soldiers to fight in the Russian Civil War. And then they formed something called the Communist International, the common turn, and its job was meddling everywhere. And not just with other members of the Communist Party. And it went on and on and on. And so I'm a generation older than McFall, so my living memory is a little bit longer. But I can't remember a time when they didn't meddle in one way or another in our elections or related things, and we didn't do the same. And it's not great, but so what? I mean, it's jaywalking, please. So yeah, they meddled. But did they do the more extreme things? There's no proof yet. It may come to light. So yeah, I'm with this Professor McFall. Actually, that's great. We agree We're on that. We're abound by our yeah. profession. But I would add one thing. Notice something interesting. The intelligence report, which was the, along with the Steele dossier, the foundational documents for the narrative, said pers Putin personally ordered this. Notice that in the Skripal affair in the United Kingdom, which has fallen completely apart. It was said by May and Foreign Minister Johnson, Putin personally had ordered it. Everything that becomes critical of Russia has become person, Putin did it, Putin did it. Now, I am sure they have no way 
of actually knowing this. They may have a mole in the Kremlin. They may intercept his communications. It's possible. But they would never reveal they could do that. Never, ever, ever. Yeah. So a great deal of this today is bullshit. But, but, but it is a reason why the new Cold War is more dangerous. And I'll end with this point. I was alive in 1962, not entirely adult conscious, but alive, when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. My memory of it is somewhat different from what I read in history books now, which is interesting. When you go back and you live through something, yeah. you read the book. But here's the thing. It's become an axiom of the nuclear age that John Kennedy saved us. And I would only add, with Khrushchev's help, Khrushchev backed off, and then they made a secret deal about the missiles in Turkey, which we told later, right? But yes, Kennedy set an example of how, when you're on the precipice, you avoid nuclear war. You know what the consequence of these Russiagate allegations is today? President Trump could not do that. With all this talk that he's a puppet of the Kremlin, or they've got compromise on him, or that he's somehow compromised by financial dealings with the Kremlin. If we come to a Cuban Missile Crisis moment, and we could have in Syria three weeks ago, we could have, we didn't, and we might still, the President of the United States cannot do his most sacred duty and save us from nuclear war because of this Watergate. That's why it's got to stop now. And that's why the new, I don't care, personally, I don't care who Trump peed on or didn't pee on. What I care about is that if we come to a Cuban Missile Crisis, he is free to be a rational statesman. And I don't see that he has any room to maneuver today whatsoever. We should think what we're doing. Okay, so yeah. let's go for one more. Um, this goes to Ambassador McFall. Is withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal a major setback, and how will this affect U.S.-Russia relations going forward? Uh, yes, I think it's a major setback uh, for the simple reason. Here's how you have to evaluate agreements and pulling out, withdrawal. Are we better today than we were uh, with that agreement? Are we more secure? My answer is emphatically no. So what did we gain by withdrawing? I honestly don't even understand the theory of the case. Like what, you know, how is this gonna make us safer? The president has not articulated what that is. I hope he has a plan B that's more than just regime change because that's, by the way, what his, his commentators that are close to the White House, I just talked to one two hours ago, that's what they're alluding to. I, that will be a disaster. I hope it's something more rational than that. I fear it's not. Um, that's number one. And with respect to, to Russia, you know, think about this. What if your goal was to unite the NATO alliance, China, Russia, and almost every other country on the planet. What's the one thing you could do? That's what the president did. We're standing on the outside here. We're the ones that are the outliers. Everybody else is good. And that, for me, that is not defending America's national interests. Professor Cohen, do you want to weigh in on the implications for US Russia? No, only that if you put two academics even as diametrically opposed in their experiences and views as Professor McFall and I um, are, you might actually stumble on full agreement. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I so just point out as a footnote, though, what really, in terms of interpretation of history, divides Professor McFall and myself about the Cold War and how it ended is that he wants to emphasize the role of people, uh, Democrats with little d's. And I would like to, and by the way, I have this uh, argument with my wife, Katrina the Vanden Heuvel, editor of The Nation, because <laughs> she's probably closer to McFall than I am. But the record really does show, and this is not a great man theory, that if the Gorbachev hadn't opened the door, that it might still have been closed today. I mean, it's just the historical record, and that the people entered the stage because Gorbachev opened up the stage. And then the people came. I remember our mutual friend, Grigory Yavlinsky, saying to me, you know, a lot of Russians run around claiming how we carried out a revolution and we did this during Perestroika. 
And we reached out and we seized our freedom. That's the way Yavlinsky claimed people were saying. But he said, Steve, I mean, come on, we all know. Gorbachev gave us our freedom. We may have screwed it up, but Gorbachev gave it to us. I think that part of history is well recorded now. And about this kinds of things, how these things happen and don't happen, probably we could have another debate with plenty of evidence on your side, and I'd like to think considerable on mine as well. So, so we're, can we're I just we're, echo that or oh, go yeah, hold on one second. So we're just we're right at the end now, and we had promised that both of the speakers a closing statement. Professor Cohen, that kind of sounded like a closing statement. Do you want to take that as your closing statement, or do you want to add more to that? I just had one note, and it's meant to be actually a compliment to Michael, but he might not take it that way. Uh, I, I, I've known Michael a long time, but yeah. never, never well. Geography, politics. Uh, but I've always really liked him, uh, as much as I've disagreed with him. I mean, he is a decent and affable civil man with no cynicism in himself. He believes so. what he says, alas. Uh, so I leave him with this I'm taking that as a compliment. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Cohen. I, you believe I, what you say, too, by the way. The winds of change, but you do not change. <laughs> <laughs> and I will decide later whether that was a compliment or not. <laughs> but I will leave you with this thought. The word tragedy appears in your book yeah. and many things you said. And I think it is a tragedy what's happened to American-Russian relations. We agree about that. I just remind you, though, of the classic Greek tragic lesson, which was the tragic flaw lies within us. I'm not so sure it's in Russia. Okay, so, so last word. Okay, in some ways, that's a last great. Last word. All right. Hold on. Yeah, thank you. Closing statement. So let me make one analytic point and then just close on, uh, on something a little more personal. So on the uh, analytic point, uh, if you buy the book, you'll, know, you'll see. <laughs> you better buy the book after all this work that we've been doing. Uh, and buy Professor Cohen's book, too, which is, which is out there. You, <laughs> you will see that on this analytic argument that we're talking about, do, do people matter? Can, do individuals matter in the making of history? I, we actually agree on that. Uh, I agree that, that without Gorbachev, the Cold War does not end. I, I consider him to be a heroic figure of the 20th century that d d should get more attention. I used to go see Mikhail Sergeyevich when I was ambassador all the time because I thought that I was with and living and, and being with a great man who had the courage to think differently uh, despite all the constraints on him. I also think that about Ronald Reagan, however. I want to I mention that. Because uh, Ronald Reagan also had a different view, and I'm, I'm no supporter of the Republicans. Uh, actually, I've voted for one Republican once, and that was my good friend. His name's Pat Shannon, only because I knew he was going to be crushed in the election. So <laughs> I could always see him every day and say, hey, I voted for you, Pat. Too bad. But, but Ronald Reagan also had that vision. And those two gentlemen, and with Shevard Nadze and, and my colleague at, at Stanford, George Schultz, I do think that at a moment in history, they, they did seize the moment and turn uh, both of our countries and our relationship in a positive direction. But I also think that other individuals also matter. And a pivot, I talk about this in my book, it's an accident of history that Vladimir Putin became president. There was no massive demand for Vladimir Putin. Uh, nobody knew who he was in August 1999. He didn't have an approval rating or not. Literally, less than 10% of Russians knew who he was when he became uh, prime minister. He was put, chosen by Yeltsin. And then the, the, the machine got behind him, and he made him an uh, 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 interim president, and then he was elected. Think of the counterfactual. I think that that choice had some very negative consequences for the future of Russian democracy, and then by the for future of our bilateral relations, as I've talked about. We won't go over that now, but think of the counterfactual. Because their chosen successor, as I write about in the book, was not, was not Vladimir Putin. This is actually Boris Nemtsov. He was chosen early on. Look, watch the video. You don't have to believe me. You can hear uh, Boris Yeltsin say it in his own words. He was the one, charismatic leader from Nizhny Novgorod, had won elections in the middle of that economic depression that we agree was three times as worse as our economic depression. He won re-election. He was Jewish, by the way, and he won re-election in Nizhny Novgorod. He, he was a friend of mine, so I do get a little passionate about him, but he was the chosen one. He became first deputy prime minister, and then 
an exogenous shock, unplanned exogenous shock. August 1998 happened. Uh, the economy collapses, and he has to. He, he, that government is withdrawn. I believe it's only a counterfactual. I can't prove it, of course. But had that crisis not happened, and Nemtsov was the anointed one, our, our relations would be different. So here, I just want to say, I also think people matter. I think it's it's too simplistic to say one or the other. But I I want to. I'm looking for agreement, and on this, we we agree. We may not agree about the counterfactual, but I do think individuals matter. That's a big part of my story. Last thing I just want to say, uh, we have known each other for a long time. Uh, I, I do respect your opinions. I deeply respect your scholarship. And we don't always agree. You're right about that. Uh, but you're one of the people that I feel like I need to read so I can think about alternative arguments. And, and I want people to come away from this, to get out of your comfort zone, to stop just thinking in your bubble, to, to watch Fox News now every now and then. I do, just to mix it up a little bit. To interact with somebody that you don't normally interact with. Because when you do that, A, you might learn something. I think it's important to interact with people with different views and different scholarship. And B, um, you might even, you know, begin to reevaluate some of the assumptions that you've made before. You've played that role for me, Professor Cohen. I thank you for that. And I thank you that you guys did this today. Well. So, on behalf of NYU, of the Harriman Institute, Josh, myself, our two distinguished speakers, thank you for being here. Copies of the book are downstairs for sale. Ambassador McFall will be here to sign them. Ambassador Cohen will also be here for some informal conversation, and hope to see you soon. Thank Excellent. you.